So our text today is uh, in the book of Acts, chapter 1, actually. And you know, uh, in, in Jerusalem, close to Jerusalem, there's a, a hill called the Mount of Olives. Uh, you've, you've heard about the uh, Olivet Discourse and all that. And on this particular hill is a place that's known as the uh, the sepulchre of, excuse me, the uh, Chapel of Ascension. And that is the place that is known to be the spot where Jesus, after 40 days after the resurrection, ascended back to the Father. Now, he, um, he was standing on this mount of, uh, which overlooks the city of Jerusalem and stands about 200 feet above the city and you can look out and see the city. But this particular place, the mount or the, uh, the place where Jesus was ascended is not as well visited or well known as probably some other places when you go on tours of the Holy Land, I'm told. For example, the, the, uh, the, whole, the church known as the Sepulchre, where Jesus actually was bar thought to be buried and, and was crucified, is visited a whole lot more than this place. In fact, this place may not even be on the actual, if you go through the tours, you may not actually visit this, this place, this uh, chapel of the Ascension, it's called. But... It's very significant in the life of the church, I believe. Uh, we, as you understand it, this, this was a place that one time, uh, back in the medieval period, people would take home sand from this spot, believing that they actually had the footprints of Jesus that they could use as a relic. And of course, somebody said, if you took all the sand that they took and put it all together, Jesus' footprints would probably be about 500 feet, you know, uh, sort of like uh, the pieces of the true cross that people uh, have kept. And so I don't know about all that, but I, I do know this, that it was an important event, event in the life of the church because it signified Jesus' final instructions to the disciples before he left this earth. And I would think that uh, when you know you're going to leave and depart this world, that your final instructions would probably be something that, you know, would be important. You would want to know that, right? It's kind of like you've heard that old joke. Uh, I've, I've told it before about the preacher that went to visit someone in the hospital and uh, they uh, wanted to say something, but they couldn't say it. So he asked them to write it down on a piece of paper and he stuck it in his pocket and forgot about it. And he was doing the funeral and he said, oh, I forgot. She gave me some final words and I want to read this. And he pulled it out and says, you're standing on my oxygen tube. You know, uh, <laughs> so that's not the kind of final words we want to hear someone say uh, when they leave this earth. But if we think about it, you know, I've seen people before uh, when they pass. The, the last post that they made would have been something that would be meaningful. So be careful about what post you make, because it could be your last. It could be the thing that you remember for. Uh, but we, we, we want to cling to those things. And, and uh, certainly Jesus, anything he said would have been important, right? No doubt. But his final instructions before leaving the earth would have been important. And they came in the form of basically three words. And that is... Uh, really think about it as witnessing, waiting, and, and you know, if we think about Jesus wanting to leave this earth, he wanted us to witness to people. He wanted us to wait, and he wanted us to be in the Word. So let's start out and talk about the first one, the Word. Uh, that was his final instructions, that we would understand and be a part of the Word. And Jesus uh, told them, in the book of Acts, uh, in the first verse, in the first book, Theophilus, uh, whoever he's writing to here, and he's talking about in the first book, which, which would have been Luke. Uh, you know, Luke actually wrote this book and the book of Luke. 
And so the first book would have been the book of Luke, which Jesus, he wrote down all the Jesus' instructions. And he said, I wrote about all the things that, all that Jesus did and taught. And so both his words and his actions. From the beginning until the day when he was taken up to heaven, after giving instructions through the Holy Spirit to the apostles whom he had chosen. After his suffering, he presented himself alive to them by many convincing proofs. And so there was uh, part of what Jesus was doing during that 40 days was giving them convincing proofs that he was not only resurrected, but he was an actual person and he was God. A period of them during 40 days. The 40 days has a very, is a very significant number in the Bible. We think about that. 40 days signifies uh, some, something about to take place, some great new event. Uh, Moses, uh, we think about, well, Noah in the, in the ark, 40 days and nights. Children of Israel uh, wandered in the desert 40 years. Uh, so 40 is very, very significant. Jesus tempted 40 days. So the number 40 is, is a preparation for something that's going to happen. Jesus was with the disciples for three and a half years, but then spent another 40 days with them after his resurrection. And we don't uh, hear a lot about that, but that was very significant that Jesus was preparing them for something, much like he is for us. So for 40 days, speaking about the kingdom of God. And then he said to them, these are my words I spoke to you while I was with you. That everything written about me and the law of Moses, the prophets, and the Psalms must be fulfilled. And then he opened their minds to understand the scripture. And so Jesus is saying, all the things that you have read about in the Old Testament, including the Psalms, the law of Moses, and all these things, they all point to me. And I want you to understand the Bible, and it's very important for us to understand the Bible as a Christological book, in that almost everything from the beginning to the end is a reference to Christ. And there's so much that it's hard for people, it's hard for me and probably for you too, to imagine how someone could read all those prophecies in the Old Testament and not see Jesus. Because to me, he's all over it. And when Jesus came to fulfill this, he said, I didn't come to destroy the law, but to fulfill it. And when he was walking one day on the road to Emmaus with these uh, two men, or well, we don't know there were men. Could have been uh, a man and a wife. It could have been, uh, we don't know for sure. But they were walking on this road to Emmaus and he comes up beside them and they didn't recognize him. And he began to explain to them. They were very sad. And he's like, why are you so sad? He said, they said, where have you been? You've been on another planet, basically. Have you not heard that the one that we were looking for, our Messiah, has been killed? He's been crucified. And at that moment, Jesus went back all the way to the Old Testament and must have been some lesson. Because he went through the Old Testament and gave them a lesson about how everything in that pointed to Jesus. And so... Uh, as we think about the Old Testament and the New Testament, understand it, that it points to Jesus. But the point Jesus is making, I think, is that we need to be people of the Word. To understand that the Scriptures are what really grounds us today. Especially in days like this where we can't always, you know, there's been times where we haven't been able to be in church. And so we find ways to be able to connect with God. And the way that we do that is through His Word. And I'm thankful that there are uh, probably some resources out there that you use as well as we do, like the upper room and things that can keep you uh, connected to the Word of God and being able to learn. And so it's very important that we understand that God wants us to be a part of reading and understanding the Word. That's why we have Sunday school. That's why we do Wednesday night services. We want to be able to reach out and, and teach those things. And as a people of God, we want to continue to learn. That's why we teach our children at home. Another thing that Jesus wanted them to do was to wait. Look what he says in uh, verse 4. 
while staying with them, he ordered them not to leave Jerusalem, <clears throat> but to wait there for the promise of the Father. This, he said, is what you have heard from me. And so Jesus instructs them to wait. Now, waiting is not something that we are good at sometimes. And it, apparently the disciples are no different. Jesus wanted them to wait until it was time. Wait until the promise of the Father and the promise of the Holy Spirit and these things that were fulfilled. And, you know, we've done a lot of waiting in the last few weeks and months. We think about, you know, every time we turn on the TV, we hear the governor or somebody say, you know, we need to wait. We need to wait. And we get tired of waiting. And, you know, we waited not to be able to have service and those things like that. But waiting is something we have to do sometimes. Whether it's, you know, long lines at the restaurants because they can't allow people to go in. I don't know if it's worth it. Some things are not worth it. But some things are. And so we wait. And there are times in the Christian life when God tells us to get up and do something. And there's other times when he says, I want you to wait. There's some preparation time. There is some uh, getting ready and getting uh, God in our lifetime too. And if we think about waiting, it's not just idly waiting and doing nothing. But it's, there's some activity that does go on in the waiting. Look what he says there in verse 14. All these were constantly devoting themselves to prayer. And so while we're waiting, we're devoting ourselves to prayer and being attentive to the Word of God. So we've got, while it's not just simply sitting around doing nothing and twiddling our thumbs or willing wood, but it's waiting on God and preparing ourselves and our hearts for whatever God has for us. And you know, I don't know about uh, what God has in, in store for this church and for others. And I know that things uh, are ch changing so fast it's hard to imagine sometimes. But yet, we want to wait and just see what God has. But while we're waiting, we're not doing nothing. We are getting closer to God. And that's very important. The, the Holy Spirit came when the church got together and began to pray. And if you look back in history, church history, every move of God, every great awakening came when people were gathered together praying and waiting. And, you know, that's exactly what happened there on the day of Pentecost, it says, when the day of Pentecost had come, they were all together in one place. This is an important point because sometimes we want to make the Christian experience a personal experience. And it, it is to a certain extent, but really it's more of a communal experience. That the disciples weren't looking for just some kind of uh, ecstatic experience on their own, but this was a communal thing. As a church. Now that's very difficult when we can't come together like we want to. But the day of Pentecost came when the church were together in one place. So I think it is important for the church to be together. Even though we may be wearing masks. And we may be setting apart from each other like, you know, other than our families. It's, 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 it's a little different. But I still think it's important. And I don't think all of our officials understand that, to be honest with you. I don't think they understand. You know, I, I was, I was uh, surprised, to be honest with you. I, I don't go to the store that much. Sandy usually goes when, when I'm uh, at work or whatever. But a few weeks ago, I, I, I went to Lowe's to get something. And it was on a Saturday. And I walked into that place, and I could not believe it. There was... Tons of people, and most of them were not, or at least half of them were not wearing masks. And it was a packed. And I thought to myself, you know, we got all this going on, and yet we're not having church. And it didn't make sense to me. And I know that there's been some, uh, some controversy over that. There's been some people pushing back and been some lawsuits. And, and I actually like what the president said about that churches are essential. You know, We've been given the task, Jesus told the disciples, to be wise as serpents and harmless as doves. And so, in a, t in a day like this, I think, yeah, I think we need God. 
I think we need it more than ever. But at the same time, we have to be careful and use common sense. And that's, that's a challenge in a time where we don't know everything about uh, this pandemic, where we're still learning as, as we're going. Uh, but I, I think there's also a danger if we see, we think about the children and, and uh, people whose lives, I think about the volunteers at the hospital and, and you know, they're, they have nothing else to look forward to. But to be able to be with, around other people, that's their, that's their social time, and they're not able to do that. So we need to pray for them, and, and we need to understand that there's a lot of other issues to consider today. And so waiting is a, is a part of that. Uh, Jesus said in verse 8, You will receive power when the Holy Spirit has come upon you, and you will be my witnesses in Jerusalem. In all Judea and Samaria and to the end of the earth. So the last one is witness. Jesus has instructed them to be witnesses to all the earth, including uh, you know you start in your own home place, and then you start spreading out Judea, Samaria, that's the surrounding places, and then the whole world. God is basically saying, now I can't witness to everybody, obviously, but as Christians all over the world. We can, we can actually do this. Um, to be a witness, I think, has been misunderstood in a lot of churches today and a lot of people. And some people have taken this to mean that we got to get in people's face and we got to tell them we're going to hell and we got to do all this. I want you to understand there's a difference between preaching and witnessing. Okay? There's a difference between preaching and witnessing. Jesus, when he came on the scene and began to preach, him and John the Baptist preached, uh, repent for the kingdom of heaven is at hand. I can imagine them standing there on the Jerusalem, uh, on the, the river of Jordan, uh, shouting those words. And that might have been appropriate. But it's not appropriate for us to go in somebody's face and to shout at them to repent. I mean, for example, as a chaplain at the hospital, you know, when I go into someone's room, if I were to walk in and begin to scream, repent, you know, I don't think that would go over too well. So we got to use a little common sense. And, uh, you know, there was a time in my life when I, I thought that was what you were supposed to do. And I'd go up to somebody out of the blue and say, hey, if you died today, would you go to heaven? Well, that's not an inappropriate question, but it may be in an inappropriate way or inappropriate time to ask that question. Like the barber, with the guy, one time he had the guy in the chair and had the, the razor Pulled his, getting ready to shave his neck and took that razor and said, if you ready to die, boy. You know, uh, that's probably not the right way to do it. So we have to be careful. There's a difference between witness. And I think as, you know, the word witness, you know, we can witness in many ways. We witness when we go to church and we pull out of our uh, driveway. Our neighbors beside of us are wonderful people and, uh, and they're Mormons. And uh, we, we enjoy each other's company and they had their children, and we talked to them a lot. And as I was getting ready for church this morning, we were getting ready uh, to go, and I had my, my tie on and walking the dog. They, she said to me, oh, y'all having church? And I said, yes, actually we are. We're, we're having church today. And we're going to try to be safe about it and all that and distance out a little bit. Uh, she said, oh, that's wonderful. And so just going to church as a witness. You don't always have to use words. You remember that, that famous saying, you know, preach the gospel, use words if necessary. It's not always necessary. Sometimes we lead a, a, a life, a, a, you know, we can say more with our lives than we can with words. And so witnessing doesn't have to be a frightful and a scary experience. But I'm going to tell you, if you are going to, if you do feel led to share something with people, I'm going to tell you what I think the best way to do. Just tell them what God has done for you. Tell them the before and after story. This is what I used to be, and this is what I am now. Very simple. You don't have to memorize a bunch of scriptures. You know, when I was in Bible college, I took evangelism class, and we actually were taught uh, all these scriptures and all this. And, and that's okay, but you really don't have to do that. All you have to do is to tell them what you were before and what you are now. Uh, Y'all have maybe we seen those cardboard testimonies where people say, I was, af I was uh, maybe afraid, and now, you know, I'm not. Well, it's kind of like one of the best testimonies to me is that the blind man in the Bible where Jesus healed him. 
And they asked him about all they asked him all kinds of questions. He said, I don't know whether he's, you know, a man of God or whatever, but this I know. I once was blind and now I see. That's a wonderful testimony. You say, well, I'm not blind. Well, we all really were blind at one time. But your testimony can be that. You, you, you know, the amazing grace. I once was lost, but now I'm found. I once was a person who had a lot of anger, but now God has given me uh, freedom from that. Or I was a person who had, was filled with fear, and now I, I don't have that fear anymore. Whatever your testimony is, what did God do for you? How has your life changed since you've known Christ? That's your witness right there. And so as we have opportunity, and here's what I found as a chaplain at the hospital or wherever I am as a pastor. I have found that if God is working on somebody in somebody's life, you'll know it. And many times they'll tell you. I used to go aggravate people. You know, when I was a young preacher and I thought that's what I was supposed to do, I'd knock on people's doors and try to get everybody saved. And I think sometimes they just said yes just to get rid of me, you know. Uh, and if God asks you to do that, I'm not saying don't do that. I'm saying, you know, you do what the Lord leads you. But for me, I have found that for the most part, I will know. And if God's working in their life, you will know. In fact, if God's not working in their life at that point, you're probably wasting your time anyway. Now, we can plant seeds. But here's what happens. Somebody plants a seed. Somebody waters it. Somebody else plants a seed. Somebody waters it. I see it all the time. And then all of a sudden, you meet this person. I walk in the room and I say, hey, I'm a chaplain. And they say, man, I need to talk to you. I want to get saved today. I, I had two people on the, uh, the floor that they're being tested for. Uh, we don't go on that floor. And so I make phone calls every day. I've done some FaceTimes with them. So I'll just make a phone call and say, hey, I'm, I'm a chaplain here at the hospital. I just want to see if there's anything that we can do or anything I can pray about. And almost every one of them have asked for prayer. And two of those have said, yes, I want you to pray for my soul. And so, you know, I didn't even have to push the issue. I don't believe you really, if you have to beat somebody in the head and aggravate them to death to get them to make a confession or to ask for forgiveness, then they're probably are not at that place in their life. In fact, I spoke with a man who... Uh, who had uh, attempted suicide one time. And he had lost his family. And I went, went to him when he was able to talk. And, and I said, would you, uh, you know, after, first of all, he began by saying, you know, I don't have anything to live for. I wish I'd have just died back there. And he said, I, I've lost my family. I've lost everything. I may go to jail. And I said, well, you've tried everything else. Why not try God? You know, he looked at me and said, first of all, he said, God doesn't want anything to do with me. And I said, I don't believe that. The God I know is willing and waiting on you. And he said, well, I'm not there yet. I don't know what it takes for you to be there. But obviously this guy wasn't at the place where he was ready to accept Christ. And I wasn't going to try to force him to do it because I would have just been wasting his time and mine too. Jesus said, that no man comes to the Father except my spirit draw them. And so if God is not working, then we're wasting our time. Again, I'm not saying you don't witness, you don't, let, you don't plant a seed, <clears throat> but it may not be the right time. It may not be the right time. I've seen people uh, get saved before in, in, in a situation and somebody said, man, I've had five preachers go in there and try to witness to him and he never did get saved. And all I can say is, well, it wasn't the right time. The Spirit hadn't got him completely. You know, it's just like the, when we plant seeds in the ground. You know, we have to prepare that. We have to get it ready. And there has to be a right time to do that. We don't do it in, in December. We do it in the right time. And so the season is something that only God knows. But the Spirit will let you know that as you're witnessing. So just tell people, basically, what... What God has done for you. And then in verse 9 it says, When he had said this, as they were watching, he was lifted up and a cloud took him out of their sight. 
The word cloud in the Bible is also very significant. It usually represents the presence of God. Remember the children of Israel, there was a pillar, a cloud that followed them. There was a cloud with Moses in the temple. And when you hear that word in the Bible, when you see that word, it really is a representation of the presence of God. That cloud of witnesses that Hebrews talks about. A representation of the presence of God's people in God's presence. And it was that cloud that Jesus was taken up into. And I want you to know today that we have that cloud, that Holy Spirit. And by the way, you don't have to look, wait on the Holy Spirit any longer. Because He's given to us when we confess Christ as our Savior. That was uh, in the book of Acts before the day of Pentecost and all that. But today we don't have to wait on that. But the cloud is something that we understand is God's presence. I got a picture here of uh, the, uh, the chapel of Ascension. Now at one time this was open. If this was the actual place where Jesus was ascended... There was no building there. And at one time, <clears throat> you could stand there and look up at the sky. But that's exactly what happened there when these men uh, said, why are, when he was lifted up, he, uh, he was took up into a cloud. And they asked the question. These two angels stood by there, and they were just gazing up at the sky. The disciples were. And they said, why are you just standing there gazing up at the sky? This same Jesus who left and ascended into this cloud will also come again. Basically, they're saying, now, it's time to witness. It's time to get busy and do what you need to do for God. Don't just stand there waiting for something to happen. But actually, be a part of understanding. Now, this building here was built uh, so you could no longer look up and see the sky. And maybe that's okay, because that forces you to walk outside now. And to look around. And when you look around, you see the city of Jerusalem as a reminder of all the people out there who need the Lord. And so as we stand here today, we think about what God would say to us as we witness. Remember that it's not about just thinking about, man, I can't wait to get to heaven, although that's a wonderful thought. But that while we're here, we have a job to do. We have a world to reach. We have a lot of people out there who need to hear something positive in a world where there's not very many positive things said. Let's pray as the musicians come. Dear Father, today we are thankful, God, that not only that we have this promise of your presence, but the promise of your return. But until then, Lord, we are to be in the Word. We are to be waiting for your preparation. And we're also to be witnessing. God, help us to be ready to give an answer for the hope that lies within us. We pray. In Christ's name. Amen. Before we sing, I just want to invite you, uh, wherever you are. I know there's some that will be watching us uh, on Facebook and on YouTube. To pray the simple prayer. We talk about praying a prayer of salvation. This is a prayer that I, I, I use at the hospital all the time. And I use in people's homes. And it simply is this prayer. It's a sinner's prayer. Some people call it. I call it the Jesus prayer. And it simply is this. I want to ask you to, to one more time to just close your eyes. And you can do this quietly. Or you can do it out loud. But repeat this prayer. Lord Jesus. Be merciful to me, a sinner. Amen. Amen. If, if you prayed that prayer and you meant it from your heart, Jesus promised that he would never, never turn you away. Amen. Let's sing.